The holidays are all about creating magic, and nobody knows better than us that holiday magic often starts in the kitchen. Also, nobody knows more than us parents that the pressure to create holiday magic at every turn can be totally overwhelming, which is what makes the newest line by KiwiCo the best one yet. Just when we thought we couldn't love KiwiCo more, they have gone and launched Yummy Crate, a fun and easy way to get hands-on with family-friendly, kid-tested recipes that help build kitchen confidence and teach a thing or two about science along the way. Each month, Yummy Crate delivers to your door high-quality kitchen tools, three recipes, and two projects that teach kitchen skills and encourage kids to explore the science of cooking. Everything in the crate is designed to foster a love of science and cooking in kids ages 6 to 14. From experimenting with the effect of pH on dough to designing artistic creations with pancake art, every yummy crate takes your meal to the next level with kid-friendly science stories, history, and fun food facts in the Yummy Zine magazine. Before each crate arrives on your doorstep, you'll be provided with an easy-to-use shopping list, which includes alternative ingredient suggestions for different diets, from vegetarian to vegan, dairy-free to gluten-free. And with no commitment, you can pause or cancel at any time. Build kitchen confidence with hands-on experimentation this holiday season with Yummy Crate from KiwiCo. Get 50% off your first month plus free shipping with the code D-I-J-F-Y at KiwiCo.com. That's 50% off your first month at K-I-W-I-C-O.com, promo code D-I-J-F-Y, short for Didn't I Just Feed You. Hey friends, it's Megan and Stacey with a holiday ask. This is not about leaving us a rate and review. Though, by all means, feel free to do that too. Yes, of course, we'll take those. But this is actually something even more important. We've put together a listener survey to learn more about you and what you want from Did and I Just Feed You. As we grow Did and I Just Feed You, it's important that we do so in a way that meets your needs. And instead of guessing at what those needs are, we'd like to hear about them directly from you. From all of you. If you're listening right now, go to didn't I just feed you.com backslash survey and take five minutes to tell us more about yourself. We promise it won't take more than that. We know that your time is precious. The survey will be live for three weeks. And as a show of thanks for your time, we're going to select three new people every one of those weeks to get their choice of a prize. We've got three months worth of community membership, a cookbook bundle, and a week's worth of coffee on us to choose from. The most important people in the Didn't I Just Feed You community are you, our listeners. We truly can't wait to hear from you. Thank you. Do you want to steer a protective crust around the potato patty so that the oil doesn't like leach in and then you get like a dense, heavy, gross, soggy latka instead of a like crisp and delicious latka? Welcome to Didn't I Just Feed You, a podcast about feeding kids. Hey, I'm Stacy, And I'm Megan. Before we jump into today's conversation, we want to take a second to encourage you to join our Didn't I Just Feed You community. It's free and easy to join. All you need to do is share your email with us. We'll put a link in our show notes to make it easy for you to join, or you can go to the community page on our site. Or visit us on Instagram where we have links in bio. We are at Didn't I Just Feed You. Isn't that super creative? (laughs) (laughs) We are super creative. (laughs) And hey, if you're able to comfortably support Didn't I Just Feed You and our efforts to publish free weekly episodes, we'd love to welcome you to our community as a supporting member. Supporting members can pledge their support monthly or annually and receive awesome perks, including two exclusive episodes every month, They're not minis, y'all. They are long episodes. Live events, lifetime access to a private Instagram feed, and a huge quarterly giveaway. And just saying, a membership to Didn't I Just Feed You would make a great holiday gift for friends and family who need a little support in their cooking lives. So speaking of our listener group, I have a feeling that our community is going to be popping with ideas after this week's episode, which is about one of my absolute favorite holiday foods latkes mm, i've had your latkes they're so good house. they're so good <laughs> it's funny so i did not grow up with latkes right. but i have a recipe that is a family recipe from one of my dear friends that i tweak just a little bit and it's the best i love it so much 
that I've come to realize that especially people who've grown up with latkes as part of their family culture, that there are so many different things. It's so not empirical. I mean, obviously that's like a dumb yes. statement. Nothing's empirical when it comes to food. It's what tastes good to you. But you know, there are so many different factors. Do you like to have something that's crispy and flat, a potato pancake that's crispy and flat? Or do you like one that's fluffy and kind of mealy and almost feels like, you know, potato meal as opposed to yeah. strands of potatoes? Like that is where the variation in your favorite recipe is going to come about. And then if you're tired of the classic potato latka, and, you know, you've been eating them all your life. Maybe you want, you know, you like adding parsnips because it's exciting and it's a new version of it. There is just so much variation. I just want to add to that, like as someone who hasn't grown up with latkes either or even really made them a part of our holiday, the last couple of years, I have realized what a great base latkes can be for so many meals like outside of the holiday. Plus, you know how I feel about potatoes just in general, which is that I love them. They're like my desert island food. Last meal would include probably actually very creamy mashed potatoes, which is a weird side tangent to take us on. But <laughs> working at Kitchen the last couple of years, we did a lot of cool, we call them show technique showdowns where it's like we might look at different ways you can make latkes. Like you talked about the end results and you talked about some of the flavor aspects of latkes, but there's a lot of like technique and there's some dogma within the technique too. Like I know, but I think the dogma is connected to the end result and I don't think people yes, talk about that enough. Yes, I think that's true. Like, do you shred your potatoes and then soak them? Do you always wring your potatoes out in a clean kitchen towel before you make your, I wouldn't call it batter necessarily, but before you make your latke mixture, what um, sort of starchy situation, flour, potato water, potato starch, there's so many things that you can use as your binder. And again, like you're saying, it probably does tie to end result. So I'm super actually hopeful that our guest today <laughs> can give us some insight on if there's something correct what really matters when it comes to making latkes because i kind of want everyone to make latkes more a part of their everyday food options yes i mean i don't want it to be part of my everyday food option because <laughs> because it feels then so it special specialness. yeah okay, fair. but if you don't have a reason to celebrate hanukkah whether it's part of your own family's tradition or you have someone in your community with whom you can celebrate and you know you want to or you just want to explore it because you're curious then absolutely i mean potato pancakes there's really <laughs> i mean like this what more what do we I, have to say that is what i'm saying like just like hummus which is like culturally important but also like can be an awesome weeknight meal i feel like latkes has the ability to do that as well like a weeknight side where you can throw some parsnips into your potato pancake mis mixture. Yes, sign me up. I want to do that. Okay, so we did bring a guest on. I have a lot to say about how I make latkes. <laughs> but again, it's tied to the kind of latka that I appreciate most. So we're going to save it to the end. Instead, we wanted to bring someone on who could talk to us about latkes culturally and in a more expansive way. But before we do that, let's take a very quick break to hear from one of this week's sponsors. Megan, you know how ever since I wrote Winner Winner Chicken Dinner, we've nicknamed me the Chicken Lady? Well, I have a nickname for you too now. And don't worry, it's more glamorous than mine. <laughs> <laughs> Do tell. You, my friend, are the butter queen. I've always known it, but your excitement over our latest sponsor, Challenge Butter, has sealed the deal. Yes, I love that. I am the butter queen. I mean, we all love butter, right? But for me, butter is essential. I get it. All of my favorite Megan recipes, both sweet and savory, rely on butter. From your famous biscuits to your butter bath corn, your garlic steak bites to your genius butter roasted sweet potatoes. 
It's why I'm always stocked up on Challenge Butter. I use both their salted and unsalted butters, as well as their European style butter, spreadable butters, and even their whipped butter. Challenge has a butter for every occasion, from cooking to baking to lathering on buttery goodness. And you're not kidding when you say goodness. Challenge Butter has been farmer owned from the start and is churned fresh daily from the freshest milk and cream milk from happy cows at its family owned farms. Honestly, it's amazing that it's been made the same way since 1911. Not to mention their products are made without artificial preservatives, fillers, or dyes, and they have no added hormones. In fact, Challenge was one of the first brands to enforce raising cows without growth hormones. Just pure butter goodness, the way the butter queen likes it. <laughs> <laughs> Head to challengedairy.com to find a retailer near you, recipes, and more. And don't forget to check out this week's show notes for a coupon to save 50 cents on your next Challenge Butter purchase. Leah Koenig is the author of six cookbooks, including The Jewish Cookbook and Modern Jewish Cooking. She is currently at work on her next book, which explores Rome's historic Jewish cuisine. Leah's writing and recipes can be found in the New York Times, New York Magazine, The Wall Street Journal, The Washington Post, Food & Wine, Epicurious, Food 52, and Tablet, among other publications. She also writes a fantastic weekly newsletter called The Jewish Table, which shares recipes and stories from the world of Jewish food. In addition to writing, Leah leads cooking demonstrations and workshops around the country and world. She lives in Brooklyn, New York with her husband and two children. Leah, we are so excited to have you here, especially me. I feel like I have this very special, meaningful connection to latkes, even though it isn't part of my pre-marriage personal history. So my husband is Jewish. He likes to call himself an atheist Jew, so he strongly identifies culturally as Jewish, but not religiously. So he didn't grow up, you know, he wasn't bar mitzvah. He sometimes they would celebrate the high holy days, but they also celebrated Christmas. I come from a first generation Greek family. So for me, I'm also not religious, but being part of the Greek church is a way still today that Greek Americans tend to stay connected to each other and to find community. So my grandmother was very religious. My mother was kind of religious. I wasn't at all, but still going to church every Sunday and participating in a lot of those cultural events was a really important part of my upbringing. So when I married Mike, and we decided to have kids, I was like, well, our kids are going to be half Greek and half Jewish. How cool is that? Let's celebrate all the things. And he was like, okay, I'm down for that. And then holidays would come around, Jewish holidays would come around and I'd be like, okay, what are we going to do? He was like, I don't know. <laughs> this is not how I grew up. And I'd so like, I would furiously research and I have a lot of Jewish friends and I would, you know, score invites to their holidays so that I could learn. <laughs> and I sort of jumped into a lot of these Jewish holiday traditions, but especially around food, given my professional backgrounds. And latkes just weirdly became something really important to me. And I think that there's two reasons why. One is that they're delicious. <laughs> <laughs> Two is that the story of Hanukkah as someone new to the Jewish faith, it was a really easy one for me to grasp onto. And the connection between the culinary traditions and the story of Hanukkah were just really clear to me. There's oil, <laughs> light for this many days, there's oil and we fry. So we've got these donuts, Sufganayot, and I also am a huge donut fan, and we've got potato pancakes that we fry up too. Like it was just something really easy for me to grasp and to pass on to my kids, even in the absence of a, of deep personal cultural knowledge. But, you know, I felt like I'd be a fraud if I got on with Megan and talked about latkes with any authority. So I feel like I'd love for you to just give us kind of a cultural context for understanding latkes and their place in the Jewish culinary history. Yeah, totally. Um, first of all, thank you so much for having me. And I love hearing your family's story. Um, I always, I feel like food comes alive in the context of people and family and celebrating together. So it's, it's really cool to hear that. 
interestingly, um, potato latkes are what American Jews think of as sort of the Hanukkah food, and they are. But the focus really isn't potatoes per se. It's actually about the oil, right? Which you sort of which you sort of touched upon, because potatoes are a new world food, right? They're native to like what is now modern day Peru, and they didn't really make their way to Eastern Europe until like the 18th, 19th century. So early latkes or like fritters were actually made out of cheese. Like there's an Italian cheese latka, like a ricotta. Yes. Yeah, I know. And um, there's also, uh, there were buckwheat, kind of similar to bellini, but yeah. you would think of as bellini now. So those kind of predated the, the latka, but once potatoes caught on, they really caught on. But <laughs> the real, <laughs> I mean, how, it's like a fried potato. Right. Like, how could they? Yeah, <laughs> yes. You can't argue with that. But so the the story is really about the oil and just super one sixty second history lesson. The story of Hanukkah celebrates the rededication of the ancient temple in Jerusalem, um, which, funnily enough, was under siege by a, a, a Greek Syrian Greek king named named Antiochus, right? Um, who basically said like the Jews of the time couldn't practice their religion anymore and tried to like Hellenize the community. And that's actually one of the reasons why it stuck for us too, because I remember telling Isaac, my 14 year old, you know, one of the first times he was old enough to hear the story, we'd repeat it every year. He was like, wait a minute. So <laughs> the Greeks and the, <gasps> like that blew his mind that, yeah. you know, it was like two of his cultures coming together, but in war. Yeah, totally. Totally. The thing that people have heard about are like the Maccabees, right? They were this sort of like small Judean army that ended up, you know, kind of underdog style, like defeating Antiochus's army. And they went back into the, the temple, which had been defaced and all the like, you know, menorahs and candelabras and stuff had been knocked over and they were like okay we're going to take it back over and they tried to find olive oil too which is how you would light the the candelabra the menorah and the the, the sort of like miraculous story that is told is that they only found oil enough to light the menorah for one night and then miraculously it lasted for eight nights which is why you know Jews throughout the world now celebrate Hanukkah by eating um, foods fried in oil. Um, so potato latkes are my personal favorite expression of that, but there are many, many different types of kind of Hanukkah fritters around the world. Can you speak to those different types? I mean, my mind is blown even to think that there was a latke that was based on cheese or buckwheat, but what are some of the other latkes that would be eaten around the world? So there's a lot of donutty type things. Um, Stacy mentioned Suscani oat, which have become more popular in America in the last, I'd say, 20, 30 years. I didn't really grow up knowing much about them, um, but they are basically jelly donuts. They, their history is that they um, were a Polish donut called Ponczki. And when Polish Jews moved to the newly formed state of modern state of Israel, they brought them and then it, the name changed to Sufgani Oat because it comes from the word, something that means sponge, which you can kind of think of the dough being like spongy and airy. So that's, that's where the name comes from. Um, so that's one. There's also a Moroccan fritter called Spenge, which I'm assuming is from the same like word root, but they're kind of like these free form rustic donuts with a hole in the middle, but they're, they're like drenched in um, like a sugar or, or honey syrup and they're amazing. And then there's, in some Sephardi traditions, um, there's uh, something called bimuelos, which are like little dough nuggets that are fried um, and also in like a syrup. Uh, so those are amazing. And then some Italian Jews actually fry chicken, which kind of blew my mind when I found that out, because I always think of fried chicken as being like, you know, Southern American cuisine, which it, it also is, but it has this like, you know, analogous tradition in Italy. So yeah, there's there's lots of other. A quick little like side note: Did you learn about that while researching your upcoming book? Thank you for asking that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'm actually I'm working on a book about um, the food of of Roman Jews right now, and not actually a Roman Jewish tradition. So no, Italian Jewish food is very regional, considering it's actually a pretty small number of people who yeah. are uh, <laughs> celebrating it. But no, I think it's more of like a Northern Italian thing. Because I'm excited about your upcoming book. Rome is one of my favorite cities in the whole world. And eating in what 
I was taught is called the Jewish ghetto part of the city. It's like some of the best food. And I like, I remember the first time that Mike and I went to Rome and ate there. His mother, who speaks fluent Italian, she's a Jewish American, but learned Italian as an adult and then started going to Italy every year just to, you know, exercise the language and be immersed. Like, would brought us to a couple of restaurants and we had the most delicious food. Yeah, actually, Roman Jews kind of in practice celebrate Hanukkah all year round because a lot of their cuisine, <laughs> it's like, it's, you know, Cucina Povera, like the poverty food or like food that you make when you don't have a lot of money um, for them was frying food in olive oil because olive oil was so abundant there that like it was actually an, an inexpensive way to prep food. So they have their most famous dish is the fried artichoke. Yeah. Uh, Tarchiophia la Giudia, which literally means like Jewish style artichoke. And it's like the leaves become like artichoke potato chips. And the inside is like this creamy, like artichokey, custardy center. And it's not a Hanukkah food. It's an it's a everyday food, but um, it, it basically feels like Hanukkah when you eat them. <laughs> okay. So back to Hanukkah, back to latkes. Potatoes now throughout the Jewish diaspora, are potato latkes sort of the default? Or does it depend on whether you're Ashkenazi or you're Sephardic? Like what's how, what's the breakdown? What are people pulling out to make their latkes and Hanukkah yeah. around the world today? Yeah, no, potato latkes are specific to Ashkenazi cuisine. Okay. Um, but because America, um, the American Jewish population is something like 80% Ashkenazi background, that's what we, that's why it's like the, the one here. Um, but if you go to other, if you go to like a Moroccan Jewish family or a Egyptian Jewish family or an Ethiopian Jewish family, they're not going to be making potato latkes. But for families that do make them, there's a lot of, uh, not about controversy, but like there's a lot of like, you know, there, people have opinions about how you're supposed to make them. Um, you know, some people like them the way I do, which is sort of like the potatoes are kind of shredded hash brown style so that they get really crispy and lacy on the edges and like they're tender in the middle. But some people like to kind of mush up the potato more and almost make like a mashed potato fritter, which is not like my favorite, but I, but people swear by that as well. So that's kind of just, the, you know, what you prefer. So the most important thing when you're frying a potato latka, it, no matter like how you're starting with the potatoes, is you want to start with a oil with a high smoke point. So you're thinking like safflower oil, sunflower oil, grapeseed oil, anything that's kind of neutral and can get up to a high enough temperature, because you want to steer a protective crust around the potato patty so that the oil doesn't like leach in and then you get like a dense heavy kind of like gross soggy latka instead of a like crisp and delicious latka um that's kind of like frying 101 but it really makes a big difference latkes and i mean for me if i don't see that lacy like potato shredded edge it's like I'm immediately like, this is going to be good because how can you go wrong? It's fried potato, but it's just not the same. You know, sometimes you get those really fluffy potato latkes, which is really not my thing. People put like baking soda or baking powder in theirs. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I need a full like, I need to stop both, not stop yes. us necessarily, but it's great to talk about like getting to the end result of like frying and what's frying and the lacy edges. But like as someone who doesn't have a cultural connect connection to latkes and like maybe just wants to make them at home to introduce my family to other traditions. Can we start like all the way back at like the best potatoes to use? And then I do want to talk about binders as like a food science geek. I want to know like Stacey's saying never baking soda to keep, keep them light and fluffy, but I'm kind of, kind of assuming that there's some starch going in there and like, are we being dogmatic about squeezing out the potatoes after they're grated? I'd love a walkthrough from either or both of you or in collaboration. From Leah, from Leah. Sure. Well, I will say, you know, again, it comes down to what people's preferences are. So there are going to be different opinions about how you make your kind of like ideal latka. But I like to start with russet potatoes because they have a high starch content and um, starch is really important for having a good textured latka. And I shred them and also onion. Um, if I'm doing a small batch, I'll use like the big holes on a box grater. But if I'm making them for you know my family or a crowd, 
I will use the shred blade on my food processor, not the not the mixer bowl with the blade, but the the one that gives you the like hash brownie shreds. And then I plop the shredded onion and potato in a clean dish towel and I just squeeze it like beyond where I think it, you know, is dry. And then I squeeze it some more because there's so much moisture in potatoes. And the adage about like oil and water not mixing is really like make you see it when you make latkes because they splatter horribly no matter what you do. So the more water you can get out, the better. I sometimes skip this step because it just takes more time and, you know, two small kids and blah, blah, blah. But if you take the water that you squeeze from your potatoes and you let it sit, um, the potato starch will sink to the bottom. Um, and that potato starch, you can drain off the water and put the starch back into the latka mixture. And people say that like really helps the texture, but oh. I don't know how much I notice a difference, but some people swear by it. So I would say, you know, people can kind of experiment and it's a fun, it's a fun tip and you kind of feel like you're not wasting anything. And I'm intrigued. I have to admit, because so far our process is exactly the same. So I'm totally intrigued. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> So from there, you add egg to bind it and some kind of, I use regular all-purpose flour. You could use a gluten-free flour. You could, you know, some people just use the potato starch either from their squeezed potatoes or like, you know, purchased potato starch. Some people use matzo meal. That tends to make them a little more um, of that fluffy consistency, which I don't love. So you can really, you know, you could make them add your starch as desired. Um, and you mix it and then you want to, you know, heat up your salt and pepper, obviously, for flavor. Um, and that's really it in terms of ingredients, unless you're going fancy and adding some shredded carrot or beets. Sometimes I do beets. Sometimes I do with some zucchini in there. You can kind of play around with different, um, you know, sweet potatoes, different kinds of uh, tubers and starchy vegetables. Yeah, Stacy mentioned parsnips at one point when we were talking about this episode, and I was like, ooh, that sounds so delicious. Yeah, um, I'm curious, Stacy, whether you do a full parsnip one or like potato and parsnip, because I've sometimes had trouble if I take all the potato out because they don't hold together quite as well. Totally. Yeah. Partial, just adding parsnips. Yeah. Yes. I'm actually a purist, and honestly, I'm happy just doing potato and onion. No, I, oh, I was going to say no onion. No, really, potato like, and on, onion. Onion. <laughs> Onion's absolutely key. Onion um, is totally key. Right? So, but like, that's it. That to me is perfect. But yeah. every once in a while, I, but every time I do add something else, I'm like, meh, that wasn't really worth it for me personally. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. I've just been happy with potato and onion. I do have a recipe in my book, Modern Jewish Cooking, that is carrot and beet. And that's a really nice combination because it's kind of sweet and earthy. And I serve them with this like um, chive goat cheese. So that's, but that's like, that's a fancy latka. That's like, right. you know, that's yeah. almost a fifth night when you're sick. Of <laughs> <Yes. latka. laughs> okay. So you've got this potato mixture. Is that something that you can make ahead of time and like let chill out in the fridge or you're making that? like when the rest of dinner is kind of like resting, ready to serve? Latkes are not a great make-ahead food. Well, okay, let me let me step back. They're not a great make-ahead food to make the batter and then let that sit because of all the oxidation that happens. But what okay. you can, some people say you can't reheat a latka. I actually think latkes reheat fairly well. So what I do is I often will fry a bunch of latkes, you know, a couple of days ahead, up to like a month and refrigerate or freeze them. And then to reheat them, all you really have to do is like put them on a single layer on a baking sheet and heat them in the oven at like, you know, 350, 375 for like five to 10 minutes. And when they start to sizzle, they're they're not like the perfect, like just out of the fryer latka, but they're very, they're more than serviceable. They're very good. Um, so I would say like, if people are feeling stressed about the fact that they have to get dinner on the table and fry like a bunch of latkes and be like a, you know, chain to the stove during dinner, you really, you really can do some of it ahead. And I wonder if the air fryer changes that. Cause I just recently got one of those convection toaster oven air fryer situations. And I feel like that might do a good job this year. Yeah. I'd be yeah. curious to I try have, it. I have not tried an air fryer latke before, but I'm, I feel like well, it I would fry it in oil first. I oh. just need for reheating. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> not giving up my own. But I wonder if just for reheating. Probably would be great. Yeah. Let's talk about variations. You mentioned carrot and beet. 
what are some of the best variations you've had? Because then I want to move on to toppings, which I think is very a very important piece of this. For sure. There's a, more controversy. You don't, <laughs> as, if we, as if we need controversy around it. But So I have a recipe in, my, in one of my books, the Jewish cookbook, for a curried sweet potato latke, which I really love. So it's sweet potato with, with you know, Indian curry spice in it. Um, that's fun and different from what, you know, I grew up with. Um, I really like zucchini latkes. I find that they, um, like the, the vegetal, like zucchini flavor kind of comes through really nicely. Um, so that's a fun one. Um, the carrot and beet one is good. Those are kind of my favorites of the non-traditional, but people, you know, people do all sorts of stuff, parsnips and, you know, other root vegetables. And um, I'm sure there's like a celeriac like yes. latka out there somewhere. <laughs> I was just thinking of that, actually. And then yeah. I was, I had this whole very quick process in my head where I was like, would that actually be good? I don't know if I like that. I I'm not sure fried, how well, it but I know be. I've seen it for sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, what I would say if someone's like new to making latkes is to really like do the potato ones first and kind of yeah. get the process down and then, and then play around and kind of see, you know, what, like where your taste and imagination leads you. And actually, before we go on to toppings, I just want to touch base because we're we're focusing on a certain kind of latka, but you mentioned that your process will be different depending on the outcome. If someone does like the idea of a more fluffier or a more kind of creamy mashed like consistency, is that a matter of dealing with the potato prep differently instead of using the shredder? what what should we be doing if that's yeah true? i mean i'll be honest because i grew up with the with the first type and that's how my mom made them i i haven't experimented all that much with the other type but i remember eating latkes in friends homes where i think i remember seeing people like they peel the potatoes and cut them into chunks and put them in the food processor in the bowl with the regular blade and just literally like pulverize yeah. the potato um, and then mix that with egg and probably smock the meal. And I'm not sure about baking soda. I don't remember, but um, I feel like that just because you're breaking down the starch of the potato so much with the food processor that I feel like you're just going to get a different, um, a different texture, a fluffier kind of more, not cakey, but just sort of like, um, yeah, like almost yeah, like mashed potato. Like cakey is a borderline good description of it. And yeah. I'm so curious if, because I haven't explored a lot of latke recipes, but like, are people are recipe writers really giving that distinction? Are you, is that something you're addressing in head notes? Like, hey, this is a thin and crispy latke versus here's a a light and fluffy latke. For sure, I feel like you in the head note you always say like you know what people can expect the flavor and the taste because you want them to you know what you want their mouths to water before they start making them. So um, I definitely try to give like a this one comes out uh, tender centered with crisp edges and, you know, little curls at the end that are like lace and all of that. Yes. You know, Megan, it reminds me of writing head notes for a cookie. Right. Like, what is this a thin and crispy chocolate chip cookie? Right. This is a soft Or it's a cakey chewy. thick yes, one. Yes. You know, you give those kind of cues. But definitely, I think that's a good point, Megan, that we should tell any listener who's curious and has never cooked latkes before to be looking for those cues either in the post or in the head notes so that you know what you're getting into. And if they don't indicate that, maybe look for a new recipe. And hopefully an uh, <laughs> accompanying photo gives some indication too. Before we go into topping, so I just have to ask for either of you, is there anything that you've tried to latka that just did not work like <laughs> any root vegetable or flavor like i'm like ooh, could you make like a sour cream and onion latke uh -huh. with like Yum. green onions incorporated you know my mind goes a million other places but is there anything that does not work the one that i tried to make once was actually like an, a grated apple latke i thought that, mm. that might be interesting but it just didn't work there are apple fritters where you like cut the apple into slices and kind of scoop out the middle and batter that and fry it so it's almost like a custardy apple inside like a a donut um yeah. that is a beautiful thing but but the idea of like shredded apple just didn't it didn't hold together and it was sort of not that exciting i would think it would add a lot of moisture and also like lose a bit of its flavor and just become really like soft exactly and kind of disappear 
I, my like, I'm going to be creative um, and then, intent was intent was to like merge the applesauce, which brings us into the toppings part with yes. the fritter. But no, it's just, you got to keep them separate. <laughs> I see 100% where you're going with that. And wow. I think you'd get a lot of caramelization too, like on the outside before that the inside was even really cooked well enough. Exactly. Yeah. Fail. Flop. <laughs> <laughs> Megan, were you headed in the same direction saying sour cream and onion? Because kind of because sour cream is such a great latke topping. And in my opinion, chives like that sour cream is great, but sour cream and chives gold standard. And then sometimes when I'm a few latkes in adding a little applesauce <laughs> to that as well, <laughs> like all three is where I go. Totally. I actually, you know, the closest any of my like Instagram posts ever got to being really viral was last Hanukkah. I posted a picture of a latka with applesauce on one side and sour cream on the other, like a black and white cookie. Yes. And people were like, what? Like <laughs> you're putting them together. But I, I'm team applesauce and sour cream on my latkes. Like I like, yes. I also like, you know, cream cheese with jam and like stuff that my husband thinks is really gross. But for me, like, that mix of crunchy with the creamy of the sour cream and the sweet from the applesauce is like, it's an amazing combination. Wait, I didn't know that people don't like cream cheese and jam because I also really love cream cheese and jam. You know what? I think he's weird. I think because when, <laughs> when he saw me put that on a bagel once, he's like, wait, you're putting jam on top of your cream cheese? And I was like, don't people do that? So I'm glad to hear that other people do it. Well, where did you grow up? I wonder if it's regional. I mean, he grew up outside of D.C. I grew up outside of Chicago. I don't know. Okay, if, I grew up in New region. Jersey. Hmm. I don't know. It's one of the, like, I don't, the sour cream and applesauce even, like, it's like yo yogurt and fruit. Why can't it, the yogurt just be sour cream totally. and, or cream cheese? It makes sense to me all around. As someone who, like, grew up partially on the West Coast and partially in New England, I feel like it works. If you're in New England, that you have, like, the um, apple pie with cheddar in the crust, or maybe that's yes. Vermont specific. So it's That's very Vermont same. specific, but yes. That it's, and it's cheese. so good. Oh, it's so good. He might, yeah, my husband wouldn't eat that either, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Megan, they say that this is the happiest time of year, but for me, it's more like the busiest time of year. Oh, same. Sometimes there's so much to do that it's hard to slow down and take in the joy of the season, which is why I lean on tools from meal planning services to organizational apps to help me make this time of year as easy as possible. Same. As you know, shopping and gift giving are one of my pleasures. So this year, I'm using an app called Elfster to help keep me organized and my shopping easy. Elfster is the number one secret Santa app in the world. It helps you create a free gift exchange so that you can organize gift giving with your family, friends, neighbors, and coworkers without stress. I'm using Elster too this year and it's awesome. You just set the date and budget and it literally takes care of the rest, even drawing names for you. As someone who's just moved to cities this year, I especially love that Elster can help organize virtual gift exchanges too. It's true. Just add gifts from brands you love, including Amazon, Etsy, Fanatics, Nordstrom, Sephora, and Zappos to your wish list. Share and you're all set. Everyone gets what they want. Trusted by more than 17 million people, Elfster is like your personal Santa's little helper. Just go to Elfster.com or download the Elfster app to get started today. Happy holiday shopping. Megan, you know that my two obsessions are food and beauty, so I am thrilled to be sharing our latest sponsor, Matter of Fact, a fantastic new skincare brand. We talk about how I lean into minimalism, but I get excited about new products too. I just need to keep my routine simple, which I can do with matter of fact. So thanks to that, I'm hooked too. It's the perfect skincare line for both you and me. Yes. Matter of fact has launched with two patent pending products that have quickly become a key part of both of our daily routines. They're Asorbic Acid 20 Brightening Sea Serum and Minimalist Hydrating Cream. We both use the vitamin C serum once a day and the hydrating cream morning and night. Most days, that's all I use, but I know that you layer makeup on top too. I do, and that feels great. Both products keep my skin looking bright and smooth. They're also light enough that my face doesn't feel heavy with products, even when I'm wearing a full face of makeup. 
I also love that matter of fact, vitamin C serum is the only one on the market that lasts for up to 16 months at nearly full potency. That saves big for someone like me who isn't consistent with her routine. And all of this is great, but honestly, the absolute best part of Matter of Fact is that they are research-backed while maintaining a commitment to honest, approachable information, which is kind of a rarity in the skincare industry. Proven results plus transparency is our favorite combination, and we're thrilled to have found a skincare line that gives us both. This holiday season, try both Matter of Fact products as part of their Better Together mini pack. You can test drive the whole Matter of Fact regimen to see improvements in the overall look and feel of skin for yourself. And <clears throat> the Better Together pack also makes a fantastic gift. Yes. Get it for $54 between now and January 1st. Go to matteroffact.com and enter the code D-I-J-F-Y at checkout for 15% off. That's matteroffact.com, code D-I-J-F-Y, short for didn't I just feed you. Okay, uh, besides the very traditional like sour cream and applesauce, what are other ways to top and or serve latkes? What I've seen a lot recently is kind of people building on the sour cream side and like draping like locks on top of that or um, caviar. Like there's like the kind of that's back to the bellini side of things, like doing mini latkes with sour cream and like a little fish row on top. That's really nice. I'm starting to see people do like pastrami on top of their latkes, um, which sounds, yeah, that, I mean, why not? Like it's like meat and potatoes go together really well. So why wouldn't you do that? In modern Jewish cooking, I have a recipe for like an apple chutney that's sort of like taking a cue from, you know, kind of an Indian flavor palette and like bringing it into the latka world. Mm. And that's really nice. It's like ginger and apple and um, various spices. Um, I think there's cardamom and stuff like that. I haven't made them no. in a little while. So that's fun. But I mean, latkes are kind of a blank canvas. You could do like a salsa verde on top. You could do latkes with egg and cheese. You know, you could do like all sorts of stuff, um, like a bacon, egg and cheese minus the bacon plus the latka. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <You know? laughs> oh my gosh. I'm so hungry now. I know. I really want (laughs) latkes right now. (laughs) So do I. I was also trying to make this connection that latkes could be fun family food outside of holidays too, because we, we talk a lot and didn't I just feed you about like how fritters are just a great vehicle for vegetables, for leftovers. They're like an easy way to get in some protein or just like have a different side dish. Do you only eat latkes around holidays or do you make them on a random Wednesday for your family? Well, as a recipe tester, I'm sure you guys know this, you end up making uh, things out of season to have them ready for, (laughs) so sometimes we're eating latkes in July, but that's that's very specific. So there are um, a lot of Jewish foods that I really only eat around the holiday. Like one example would be um, commentation, the triangle cookies that you eat on forum, those for me, like don't make sense outside. But I do, I definitely eat latkes outside of the holiday. They're, you know, if I go to like a Jewish delicatessen, I'll often get like a side of latkes because they're just like, instead of having French fries, because they're there. Yeah, because they're so delicious. They're there, and someone and else made them for you. So they might the be thing. more delicious. The thing about latkes is, you know, it is a deep like a well it's more of a shallow fry it's like somewhere yeah. in between a deep and a shallow fry so you do use a lot of oil so like I kind of have to have a special occasion like I maybe I would make them for like a brunch or something but I don't usually make them if I'm gonna fry outside of the holiday I'm make, usually making like schnitzel like like chicken schnitzel or something that feels a little more main dishy but I feel like if if you like to fry food like they're they're a great thing to make year round I do like to fry food <laughs> which is a weird thing to say. I'm curious if either of you have any tips for making latke frying less messy or is it something Mm. where you just like embrace the mess of it? Can you choose a different pan? I'm uh, envisioning always that it's cast iron, like a big cast iron skillet that you're frying in, but please correct me. It can be. Mine isn't. Leah, what about you? How are you frying yours? I use an all clad, like a aluminum pan. For me, when I use my cast iron, they burn they they burn more quickly. I don't know if my cast iron is just kind of a faulty one or something, but I like a, I like a like a aluminum or stainless steel pan. 
but a splatter screen is really yes. key if you want to keep the, the oil off your your walls because they really do no matter how much water you sweep out they sputter and you know kind of coat your whole like kitchen walls with oil so a splatter screen is really key to keeping that at bay I feel like our process is so identical that the recipe that I've been working off of, which is supposedly my dear friend's longtime family recipe, I'm like, is it? Or did someone in her family grab a copy of Modern Jewish Cooking? <laughs> Pass this recipe it's off. Possible, but I think it's one of those things <laughs> like a chocolate, like we were talking about chocolate chip cookies earlier, like yeah. <laughs> over time and through the generations, like the best practices kind of just like come to the surface, yes. you know, like I feel like, you know, people just have handed down what, what works and latkes are so elemental, like there's so few ingredients that technique really matters. So I think it's more just that like, there's kind of a right way to make them yeah. um, and a wrong way. So that's probably, I mean, maybe they have modern Jewish cooking. I don't know. <laughs> I have both the recipe I've been using forever as it was originally given to me and your book. So I'm going to compare and make sure they're on the up and up. But <laughs> <laughs> I will say that also this idea that you know, with a traditional food that's been made by so many people around the globe for so long, this idea that I, you know, approximately, you know, we'll call it a right way, but of course there are variations, but that this right way kind of emerges and that this right way is also really simple and isn't about, you know, I don't know, Megan, you were telling me that you once worked on a package for kitchen.com that, you know, had you guys testing out like all these wild techniques yeah, well, just those variables, like, is a box grater really better than the food processor? And that question ultimately comes down to, like, how many latkes are you making? But then yeah. there was, like, pulling out the starch tip of, like, the drained potato starch, like Leah was mentioning, versus, like, just using potato starch, whether to add baking soda or whether you should use, like, a combination of potato starch and all-purpose flour. But I also think there's something there to talk about in internet food media where it's like we kind of want to make something more complicated than it needs to be yes. in order to create content yes. and <laughs> and i think like what both of you are saying is like if you use the right potatoes you drain them well you add a little bit of egg and a little bit of starch and you season it well and use like a high smoke point oil Yes. then you kind of can't mess it up. It's going to be great. And then it's going to be muscle memory, like doing it that same way every year or every holiday. And then adjusting that based on your taste. You know, if you yes. like a little more onion, a little less onion, I actually have taken to adding a little bit of white pepper mm -hmm. to my potato mixture. I jot, I jotted down at some point in the show notes, we'll put it, I jotted down the amount, but like it's, I just was experimenting one year and I was like, oh, that's kind of nice. There's a little something in the background. You can't even really detect it, but it gives it a little bit of a warmer spice than black pepper, but just kind of in the background. But yeah, like flour, potato, onion, oil. And I do think even though it's not like, it's not a cookie, it's not something that you have to like wait and bake to make adjustments to. We've tried, we've tried to start setting this precedent of like, if you are going to change one thing in a recipe or a routine, like just change that one thing first and see what happens rather than being like, oh, well, I am going to do different starch this year and I'm going to add white pepper and be, because then you'll never know like which change really impacted your end result. Yes, yeah. totally. The nice thing is that it is something that happens every year. So you can kind of year on year kind of build your tradition and build what tastes the best for what your family likes, what you like. So Leah, this year, what's it going to be? Just the classic? Are you feeling okay. tired? Are you feeling burnt out? Are you feeling inspired and experimental? What are you thinking? Here's the thing. First of all, eight nights is a lot of nice to eat fried <laughs> food in a row. So what we usually do is start out strong and then by like night four or five, we're all like, my husband and I are just like, let's have salad <laughs> yes. and like some olives on top to give the olive, you know, for the olive oil yes. like, connection. 
But the other piece is that my kids actually don't like latkes. <gasps> I have a two-year-old and a seven-year-old, and they like French fries. Um, but for some reason, I like the latkes it's look befuddling. different. It's Yes. It's so weird. Kids are so weird. I was a picky kid, so I'm so not. They're so weird. I'm not. I'm not worried about them. They'll get there. But what they do like are briny foods. They like olives. They like pickles. So yes. on our on our first night, what we tend to do is make um I make potato latkes for me and my husband, and then I make fried pickles and olives for the kids. So yes. that is That's not those fun. are not traditional, but they are fun. It's like the bringing the county fair. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. And the next night, we usually do like a susanio, like or a simuelo, like some kind of like sweet donutty fritter because nobody can argue with that. And then the third night, maybe I'll do like the, the sweet potato one or something to, to mix it up. The fourth night, maybe I'll do chicken schnitzel. And then usually after that, it's like we just kind of coast through the rest of the holiday. Yes. <laughs> it's a lot. It's a lot of heavy fried food to do eight nights in a row. It is. And this year is in Hanukkah immediately after Thanksgiving. Yeah. It's yes. Sunday, Sunday after. So maybe we'll do like a, I'll put some leftover turkey in my latkes. <gasps> yes. Yeah, be fun. Or like something like turkey gravy on top of latkes could be amazing. Ooh, yummy. Like <laughs> stuffing, like a, you know, turkey Ooh. and gravy. I wonder if there's a stuffing connection Left, somewhere there. Leftover too. stuffing fritters would be amazing. They wouldn't be they latkes. would be amazing. They wouldn't be. Stuff. But I would still eat them. <laughs> I would eat them. <laughs> Stacey, what about you? What's your latke tradition? At home well, with the boys. so Hanukkah, I, I started with my story and I'll end with the end of the story, which is that my boys are 11 and 14. So we've been doing, we've been parenting for years now. And at some point, several years ago, I was like, this is too much, Mike. <laughs> like, these are not even my holidays. I absolutely love enjoying that, like love celebrating them rather. But you need to do a little heavy lifting here. And he was like, I don't know. So we actually are, the biggest thing was that our kids started to really think of Hanukkah as additional gifts. Mm. And that kind of was uncomfortable for us. So we were like, okay, you know, it's up to dad. Dad's going to decide how we want to celebrate this. So we light candles every single night. And at some point in the eight nights, depending on where Hanukkah falls in the calendar, and you know how busy we are and what works with our schedule. I'll do one big dinner that really centers around the latkes because that's what my kids like. And I don't know if it's a traditional Hanukkah dish, but I make brisket because that's what all the boys want. No, it actually is. It's become a thing in the States because the brisket, like the saucy brisket and the potatoes are so good together. So you're, you're like, your intuition was spot on for that one. Yeah. So we do brisket, we do latkes, and then I'll do something. But I'm Greek. I'm first generation Greek. And a couple of years ago, Mike and I traveled to Thessaloniki. And there's a big, relatively speaking, Jewish community in Thessaloniki and a long history of Jews fleeing to Thessaloniki. And we got kind of interested in Sephardic cooking. And I've been curious to kind of explore. But every time I think I'm going to do that, everybody's like, but you're going to make that one brisket recipe and those latkes, right? Like that's what they want. So it just kind of depends on how much energy I have to see if I can like do that one night and then another night kind of explore something new, which I would love to do this year if I have the energy. <laughs> I guess that's like the problem with creating traditions, right? Is then your children expect that. They're like, oh, <laughs> but we have to have the brisket night, right? Yeah. Yes. That's great. I'm glad that they feel connected to those dishes. Well, I'm personally actually th scheming, thinking about how fun it might be to make both kinds of latkes with my family as a way to introduce them to the traditions nice. and talk Taste about, test. How, yeah, and figure yeah. out like, what we prefer just for fun and to learn about Hanukkah. Yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah. Leah, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, it was my absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. You guys are so fun. <laughs> okay, so Stacy, I have to tell you something. Tell I was me. transformed by <laughs> our interview with Leah, which is to say at the top of the show, I was like, oh, we can make week weeknight latkes a thing. And maybe I was wrong. I was wrong. 
I didn't want to say it early on. I wouldn't make them. I wouldn't make them. But also I have that emotional connection to it being a Hanukkah food. So I was curious what Leah would say. But you know, what's funny is that she was like, no, it's not really weeknight food. But then she was like, you know, she's frying them up multiple nights in a row on Hanukkah during Hanukkah. So but did she say she was frying them up multiple times or is she doing no like a night one like and she's then a making night them four. and she's like reheating them the other night yeah maybe. no she said but she said like on night four she might do like a carrot one yeah you know I, I think they're a big mess and a lot of work and you know everybody who's been listening for a while knows that i freaking hate like i'm a clean as you go when you leave my kitchen at night when i go to bed it's clean like, yeah, I wipe down the stove. Everything's away. Like it has to be that way for my sanity. So it's it says a lot for me to say this, but latkes are one of those things where it, you just get in the process. Like part of what I like about making brisket to go with latkes is that brisket's really easy to make ahead. Very hands off. Yes. Yeah, so that yeah. I just like. I've either made it ahead or it's in the last. You know. 30, 40 minutes of cooking on a low heat. It's just going so that when everybody comes down, I usually have just like some people do with pancakes. I don't bother, but you know, I have the stove on the absolute lowest heat setting. I have half of them made and I call the kids down and they're kind of setting the table and bustling around and like checking out what's going on in my pan as I make the second half of the latkes. And I just know that it's going to kind of like be messing a little bit on the fly. Yeah. And then once they're done, I get those on the table so that half are like fresh out of the fryer, half are fairly fresh out of the fryer, but they've been warming for a little while. And then like, just pull the brisket off the oven and a salad and like dig in. Yes. That's sort of my process, but it's messy. I think that's like a really good bird's eye view of what the process is like and how to incorporate it into like a big holiday meal. I also just need to say, I can't believe I don't own a splatter screen. I can't either. For someone who's like, I like little gadgety things as much as I say that I'm like a minimalist. I think even like unitasker kind of tools I would totally use. And like we fry a lot. I make a lot of fritters in the summertime, like zucchini fritters. I'm thinking of like pancakes. And do you deep tofu. fry your fritters? No, just okay. like a lot. But it's like a shallow pan fry. Like, and we did not get into this with Leah maybe as much as we should have. But I think there's something where you need enough oil so that the like edges of the lot cut or the fritter are sort of covered, but you still like deep frying them would make them not as good inside. Like they yeah. lose their texture because they kind of steam in the oil instead of get crispy all around so my zucchini what i call fritters are actually more like zucchini pancakes yes where i do it's a it's a heavy slick of oil but it's not like when i fry a latka which is like you know i don't know like a couple of inches yeah in a wide shallow high-sided pan versus when i fry chicken where i'm going you know three or four inches up at least in a pot yeah, And I have my like thermometer and the whole setup. But really the only things that I use my splatter guard for are latkes and our fried chicken. That's the only things that I fry fry. Yeah. And even just that alone is worth it. Man, I'll fry tofu on a weeknight. I'll fry like... Really? And like you'll shallow yeah. fry it and like do... I oh, mean, wow. it's, I feel like there's a meme here. I haven't figured out what it is yet. <laughs> like... It's you and frying. <laughs> what level of sad are you on a weeknight and like to how much oil you're frying your food? <laughs> <laughs> Do you like know? I'm thinking of tofu as that slick that you described for yeah. doing like pancakes or your yeah. fritter style pancake, veggie pancake situation versus like latkes and having a good depth. Yeah. Versus like fried chicken and it's like a whole vat of oil. Yes. Like how deep is your sadness? <laughs> how deep is your sadness? <laughs> um, that's hilarious. I just, this is a random thing, but you know, deep fried Oreos are a thing at like the yes. county fair. I'd never had how one. How did county fair come up twice in this episode? I'll I know, know. I don't know. Because we're talking about frying foods. So I had never eaten a fried Oreo before this summer. 
of course, take a guess how it ended up in my hand, in my mouth. Isaac ordered it. Yes. <laughs> like the most predictable thing ever. And I was like, oh, really? Like, I don't know. And then when it came out, I was like, okay, well, I've never had one. I'd like to try it. And he was like, oh, no, because he knew that I would like it. And I was like, oh, I think I just didn't have a conception of what a fried Oreo was. And I didn't realize that the batter around it would be donut-y. Yeah. Like, if you told me that I'd eat a donut stuffed with an Oreo, I'd be like, oh, I'd like that. But when I just heard the words fried and Oreo together, that's not what I imagined. And what I imagined wasn't good. But there you go, fried Oreos. Maybe Which, that's something you can do for Hanukkah, like the way that's Leah's what I was saying. Say. I yeah. love that Leah was like, oh, yeah, we do like fried olives and pickles. Like, I love when we have a guest who unlocks a different way to look at a tradition so that you can make it yes. fun for your family. Like, if potatoes are not your bag, which no judgment, but also like, <laughs> you're lying judgment. right now. You're <laughs> lying. You're a liar. No judgment. I know if there's one thing you judge, it's people who don't like potatoes. Like how, like uh, how deep is your sadness if you don't <laughs> like potatoes? <laughs> but that's like another, or your kids, right? Like Leo was saying, her kids don't really like log because there's a different way to celebrate the tradition and still tie it into the story of it. Yeah. Cause again, like she said, it's really about the oil. Yeah. You know, that's what it's about. And that's why in all these traditions across the Jewish diaspora, there's all different kinds of fried foods and that it can change over time with the ingredients that become available to the community. You know, I was like, oh, duh, I can't believe I didn't even real like, of course, potato latkes are right. It's a new world ingredient. (laughs) Right. Yes. Obviously, I would like to eat a cheese based latke or fritter. Give me that. Yes. Yum. Okay. Well, now I'm super sad that we recorded this ahead of time and that latkes aren't in my like I know, immediate I want today them future. Now. I have a single <laughs> russet potato in my crisper drawer. Do you think that that will? You'll be sad. No, latkes. don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Okay. It's not enough. You'll ha- you'll have make like <laughs> two little latkes and you'll be so sad. You'll just be like, I me. want more just for just you, but for it's me. not enough. Latkes, you need to make like plenty of them. Yes. Go okay. To town. Okay. I will wait. So good. So that we can also ask our listeners community, do you make latkes? And if you don't usually, are you going to now? Um, I definitely have them on my holiday docket now. So tell us by joining our community, or you can always send us an email or leave a comment on Instagram where we are at Didn't I Just Feed You? Basically, any way that you can find us and communicate with us, <laughs> it makes us happy. We want to hear from you. And if you love hearing from us too, sign up for our newsletter. We promise to only email you twice a week, once when there's a new episode and with our Friday find pick of the week every week, find the link to sign up on our site or in our Instagram bio. And last but never least, don't forget to subscribe to Didn't I Just Feed You wherever you get your podcasts. And if you have a minute, rate and review, it's our holiday gift. Please. To ourselves. Please. No, they, have, they have to give it to us, but I just declared it like I could like use the force. It yes. is our holiday gift that you will give to us. <laughs> A huge thank you to our editor, Samantha Gatsik. I'm Megan. And I'm Stacy. Stay sane and well fed until next week. Be sure to subscribe to Didn't I Just Feed You wherever you're listening. And don't forget to rate and review.